So welcome everyone. Um, we have Torda Necromorbus on the channel today as part of Black Metal Legends. Uh, you might know him as the drummer of Early Funeral Mist. He's also got his own studio, Necromorbus Studio, where bands like Vartain, Mayhem and Behexen have um, recorded there and had their music engineered there. He's also the live sound engineer for both Vartain and Mayhem, so he's got quite an epic CV. And um, yeah, thank you so much um, for being part of Black Metal Legends. And um, well, one thing I really want is the drummer's perspective. And also, it's really great to have you here to provide some perspective for everyone who's watching your channel, what to look out for on recordings, how to behave yourself in the studio and how to come across professionally when you're working with um, engineers. So yeah, thank you so much and uh, welcome to the channel. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you for having me. Who are your big drumming inspirations and what got you into playing drums? I always kind of uh, gravitated towards drums as an instrument, as uh, something I was always interested in. And uh, um, I borrowed a kit from my brother's friend. So that's kind of how I got a bit into it. And I was, was just playing along with, uh, with records like... Beatles records and uh, Halloween and like things like <laughs> very diverse. Um, I it got a little bit more serious when I started like seventh grade and I started doing doing more like ensemble playing, playing with other people, and it just progressed from there. Um, yeah. When it comes to like your um, ex like metal or drama inspirations, who are they? Um. Well, very early on, I would say Ringo Starr, for sure. Uh, as I said, I was playing along with Beatles records, and it was something that kind of really got me started. His drumming is not, like, overly complex or anything, so it was, like, a, yeah, a good way to get into it. Um, eventually, when I got more into, like, playing metal, well, very early on, it was, like, Metallica, so Lars Ulrich, even though people say he's not very good but uh i think he did some very interesting things back in the days and uh, so it was like that uh, the halloween drummer definitely uh can't remember his name it's, it's really weird unfortunately it's dead um steve ashame from d side big inspiration same with uh, gene hoglan uh pete sandoval to some degree i would say um, Hellhammer for sure. Um, drummer of Sadus can't remember his name either, but yeah, I think that kind of so it's, it's a lot, lot of drummers, but that's kind of what, what, uh, where I kind of picked up a few things at least. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And, um, I, I'm one of those people where when I'm listening to, uh, metal music and playing in a band, I'm always kind of focused in on on the drummers, especially what they're doing, because uh, because I was speaking to Nocturnal Culto about this, and um, you know, a riff is always a riff, but a riff can be changed into so much uh, with the drums. Why do you think guitarists need to listen to the drummers? For someone who's maybe not not too um, familiar with working in projects and with groups, because I've had some people say to me, "Why should I listen to the drums if I'm a guitar player?" And I think that's one of the strangest things. I've ever heard so i just want to i just want your perspective on it i i can say because this has something to, this has a lot to do with uh, how things work nowadays with uh, especially when it's guitar players writing music uh back when we started out it was um you you wrote riffs maybe you recorded it on a tape recorder and you just had a tape with riffs so it's very open so when it was presented to the drummers uh it was yeah an open field you kind of probably had some some direction at least but uh, it, it wasn't very kind of decided and what's happening now is that uh, people do basically demos from start to scratch and then present that to the rest of the band and the drummers if, if they don't have very much imagination they might just play exactly what is uh, programmed uh and it kind of it, it really takes away the, the the personality so there's there's so much less uh of this kind of 
cooperation in the band nowadays. Um, so uh, that is something that I when I when I work with productions, when I'm working with bands and we're preparing for recordings, I I always tell them like try to present the music, but don't present like the drums. Don't send it like pre-programmed. Just send with a click track or whatever, and just have the drummer kind of work out the the beats. So. Yeah, I I think uh, like I said, it's it's um, it, it's it's a problem nowadays. It's very unfortunate. I I really hope that we can get out of it, but I, I'm I don't have high hopes. Okay, yeah, I can understand because it seems like everyone's kind of gone more introverted when it comes to making music now. It's usually just like one person doing everything, and I find it so much less fun writing with my uh, writing by myself than with other people yeah yeah for sure uh you're not bouncing off any ideas with anyone uh maybe maybe to some degree i'm sure but but uh it, it's very much like a solitary process for for many people mm, for sure. and then talking about collaboration like let's let's dive into like early funeral myths so how did how did Funeral Mist actually start, and um, what was the writing process like for Devilry? The band started. I wasn't in the band from the start, and I don't even think Arlo was. Um, there was some guys from the south of Stockholm. Um, they came over, recorded a demo, which is basically what I uh, consider to be the the first official recording that I did in the studio, even though I had been like experimenting with stuff before. But it was the first thing that kind of got released, even though it was just a demo, but it was kind of a big thing for me. Uh, Sidetrack. So they fired their drummer and uh, they asked if I wanted to join. So I did that. Uh, shortly after that, the guitar player started playing with Dark Funeral and got very involved with that and the other guitar player was uh i don't know he he is kind of weird anyway so uh it ended up with uh, just me and Ariok rehearsing together and and um the first thing which is what turned into the havoc demo was actually supposed to be his side project uh, but he decided last minute to just put the basically put the funeral mist logo on it, and no one objected to it anyway. So that's that's how that happened. And after that, we started working on Devilry, which also has uh, some stuff from the from the old uh, from the demo recordings. Uh, yeah, so we were just rehearsing all the time because we didn't have anything else to do basically all right cool so was it just like very very organic just like being in the studio and just uh, creating together and just bouncing off ideas I, yeah i would say so i i think uh, the th the thing is that Arya, I, I would say is, is um, he's a bit he he's very determined with how he wants things uh but at the same time like yeah, I, I would suggest a lot of things and and um and uh, he would just say yes or no um what my goal with what i did with funeral mist was to have have it kind of interesting all the time because the riffs are kind of repeating and it's, it's long passages with just the same riff and i just wanted something to happen all the time so it's like uh kind of a controlled chaos kind of thing it's like a lot of surprises so that that was always my my uh yeah my my part of it what what i contributed with i would say sweet and whose idea was it to have a, um, a drum solo in the middle of the god supreme because that was epic that is that's yeah. probably like one of the highlights of the um, the album, just that song, just the way it flows and moves. And then you've got the drum drum break in the middle and it's just like, yes. Yeah, it must have been my idea. I can't imagine any other <laughs> thing, but I mean, yeah, he went along with it and you know, it was a kind of a fun, fun thing to do, I guess. 
No, I was, it's great because I was listening to um, I was listening to Early Funeral Mist, you know, just in the lead up to this, and um, it brought back so many memories because I used to put those two albums just on repeat for ages and ages, like um, like when I was like eighteen or nineteen, and and here's another story. So um, my cousin, he's um, responsible for getting me into extreme music, and I said to him, <laughs> I said to him one time, "What's the scariest band?" And then he said, "Funeral Mist." I also noticed, like, um, like listening to these albums again, the actual approach in songwriting completely changed from Devilry to Salvation, because like Devilry has lots of quite melodic guitar parts as well, and mm. Salvation has a more kind of, um, it's a lot more chaotic. It it seems like um, all of the songs are more kind of. The, it's almost like they're less thought out in a way, but I know it's that's no that's I know that's a horrible way of explaining it, but it's like there's more kind of emphasis on feeling and atmosphere in the writing in Salvation. So what what do you think changed, and what what exactly changed between like the writing styles between those two albums? Nothing really, as far as I'm concerned. It, it was more of a continuation. I, I, I guess like production wise, it it. I mean, it sounds very different. Uh, it it has a much bigger sound, where Devry has a much more direct sound, kind of. Uh, but yes, yeah, songwriting wise, it, I can't really think there was any. It, it wasn't on purpose, at least. Mm -hmm. So I actually never thought about it. Oh. Uh, but, but one one thing I can say because. With Devilry, as I said, it it had uh, some old songs, and especially the song "Funeral Mist" is from the first demo, and that one is very melodious. And that's kind of how I don't know if you've heard the first demo, but that that's how that whole demo sounds like. It's much more like Emperor style with mm. the keyboards and everything. So uh, uh, it kind of had a, a a bit left of of the old stuff, uh, but Salvation just moved moved on completely yeah and what was the um what was the drum kit that you used on um, both releases on devilry i used um uh, thomas wingstar which is uh, my first kit the first kit that i bought uh, which i still have actually and for Salvation, I had uh, Tama Rockstar DX. Uh, so it's like a little bit of an upgrade, but that's yeah, still a kind of a low tier kind of kit. Uh, still have that one also, but both of those are just sitting on shelves in the basement. Oh, gotcha. But yeah, uh, I, I can say like uh, everything back then was also kind of because now. I focus so much on like have which drum kit to use, which heads to put on, uh, which snare drum, symbols and everything. Back then, everything was just like this is what I have and this is what I use. All the symbols I had, uh, that's what I used. It was just a weird mix of uh, of different kinds of symbols. The drum heads were probably a bit worn. And uh, so, yeah, it was just a very different kind of thing. What made you want to dive more into production in the first place? Um, I yes, I I don't really know. I I think um, one thing was because I did a little bit of experimenting with. Uh, kind of bouncing things uh, yeah, yeah I don't know what to call it but uh, I would record stuff on a tape recorder and then I would play on that tape recorder record another one uh, and and just play along with that so it was like bouncing back and forth so this, this idea of like putting uh, multiple takes together was something I, I it did that like just interested me early, early on, and um, when I was around, I don't know, fourteen, fifteen, maybe something like that, I bought this uh, four track cassette Porta Studio. Uh, so then I had the four tracks, and I just used that for 
uh, to, to its uh, maximum. Um, I w I worked out a way to like how to get the drums kind of like I could do it on three channels, just bounce it down to one channel, and then it just bounce things back and forth. So that's what I was doing for the early demos. The 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 two funeral miss demos are recorded on that bunch of this early demo stuff. It's it's that. Uh, eventually, I inherited a bit of money and uh, I decided to buy a, a sixteen channel uh, tape deck. I bought a bigger mixing desk and I, just, I from there I just expanded. Uh, so, yeah, what what made me want to get into it i guess it's just like the the idea of just layering different sounds i think and uh, then of course like having multiple channels to record and you can manipulate it later so it's yeah always always something that uh, uh interested me okay epic epic and when it comes to the like some of the samples used in salvation what are some of them from um, cause I know you've got like, it sounds like some Latin singing and you've got like dogs barking as well. You've got like whip cracking noises and, and all these choirs and stuff. Like what was, um, first of all, what are they and what was the, um, and who, whose idea was it to come up with all these effects and extra sounds? Uh, in Salvation, most of it are, is from, uh, the seventh seal, uh, or in Swedish, the Kunde in Seglet. Uh, it's a Bergman movie. So that's definitely something you should uh, check out if you, if you if you haven't seen it. Uh, it also kind of the, the story in a way goes a little bit together with uh, salvation, I would say. Um, there were other samples. We did some. You had this glass glass breaking, for example, in uh, in in Devilry and mm. it, at some point that was just us throwing throwing bottles against the wall uh there's some weird noises which was i was using a pitch shifter just took a microphone and shoved it into into the speaker cones it's like pitch shifted feedback hmm. we uh let's see is it on devilry where we have this clanking in the beginning that's that's the door to the to the old studio it's like a uh, air raid shelter door, just thick, heavy metal door. So some of it is practical, some of it is from movies. Uh, as I said in Salvation, a lot of it is from the Seven Seal. And whose idea? It was, that was completely Ariok's idea. Oh, cool. uh, I didn't really have anything to do with that, uh, apart from the practical stuff, of course. Mm. No, I love that. I love the creativity as well. I love that. And um, good. talking about your drumming quickly on Salvation, it's on the third song, Holy Poison. Now, it goes back to uh, what you're saying about keeping things moving. But I, but at the end of the song, there's like one snare hit. And then once you repeat the riff, you've got dah, 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 and you keep repeating that fill with extra snare hits. Like, what was the idea and inspiration behind that? Because I thought that was genius. Yeah, I, I really like the part myself also. <laughs> uh, it really confused Ariok. I remember when when he put the guitars on it in the studio, I had to sit there and count for him in the control room because he just got confused. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's just the matter of shifting everything forward one more beat every 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 round. Um, how did I think about it? This it was just something that came up. I can't, I can't remember, but it, it it was really typically the kind of thing that uh, that I was doing at the time, just shifting things around. You, you'll hear also some fills that instead of coming at the end of the beat and then uh, uh, then going on with the with the downbeat, I do the fill at the beginning of of the bar instead. So like yeah, just moving things shifting things around oh, i love it i love it it's so cool do you do you play much drums now no i i have this idea that i'm 
going to at some point I'm going to just sit down and play drums. It's just that I'm I'm doing so much stuff. Uh, and when I have let's say that I have like spare time for something, I I I don't want to be creative in that way or I d I don't know what to say. Like uh I I pick it up now and then I play a little bit. It, it's just it's very frustrating because I have to s- kind of start from scratch all the time. So it, it, I mean, if you haven't played for a while and then you just sit down and start playing, it you feel like a beginner. And uh, to just like get over that hump, like maybe I have to be active for like two weeks or something and and uh, play like every day. I don't have that determination. Uh, that being said, I like last year, for example, I picked up a bit of uh, of uh, the jazz drumming that I was doing way back when, and uh, so I, I just wanted to. I I wanted to get a bit better at what I or or just like build on what I what I had been doing before so um I I do things like that I do the same with piano I do the same with guitar it's like if I want to do something just practice something I'll just pick it up and jazz drumming of course is it's 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 not such a an aerobics kind of thing so uh it, it's something you can just like sit down and play with feeling instead of playing with the muscle mm. so um yeah but I, I i i never managed to do anything regularly unfortunately oh that's a shame that's a shame because um yeah i just i just really like your drumming and um going back to what you said about muscle like how hard were you hitting in salvation and devilry because it sounds like you're really bashing the fuck out of the kids yeah yeah i, I was but here's the thing i never thought about it until it was kind of pointed out to me uh i th- there's one thing because i i i was always paying attention and listening a lot to how the kids sounded in the room you know if you didn't hear the kicks uh which is a pretty common thing like people don't play very hard with the kicks if if you didn't hear the kicks i would just like stomp harder and it's also like as I said, with like how the, how the drums sound in the room, you can hit them hard, but you also have to hit them with with good technique. If if you're just like hitting really hard, you you're just choking the drums. But like to to get the the snap and everything, uh, I guess it was just something like because I was I was also uh, practicing by myself a lot, or just playing songs and just playing playing by myself. And, and uh, so, so I was really just paying attention to how the drums sounded, and I wanted it to come through uh, while I was playing with others. Yeah, for sure, because that's one thing that I really noticed now was like the purity of the actual sound as well. Like, um, it doesn't sound like there were any triggers uh, yeah, not not on devilry because I I didn't have anything. Like it was it was it was something that I really that I always wanted because mm-hmm. like with the old death metal stuff that I listened to, it was always like you know, yeah, no, kick triggers especially. Uh, Salvation, I think there's probably kick trigger there. Maybe the snare. I can't remember. Maybe. I don't think so. I think it's only the kick. Mm. Yeah, because like after listening to it, it does not sound like the um, the snare was triggered at all. Because you can you can hear like you know when you hit a snare in a certain room, and it kind of feels like the air's kind of like moving and expanding. Like you can kind of hear that in Salvation as well. And um, I think it's great, like how you just wanted to get like that pure sound as well. Like going back to um, what you mentioned before about like specific kits and symbols now like for the drummers watching this like what kits do you prefer and what symbols and snares do you t- tend to go for these days if you want just to to have something where you can be sure that it's going to sound great yamaha 9000 recording is it's all it, it always sounds amazing different kinds of tuning and everything it's, it's it always sounds great 
that being said, I have I have a bunch of other drum kits as well. I have uh, a couple of Sonar kits that are really nice, you know, like the old uh, Sonar Phonic Plus with, uh, with these really deep uh, toms. Uh, so that one sounds great when when you want that kind of sound. When it comes to snare drums, I have a bunch by now. Um, I think it's probably like 17, 18 snare drums. I would say like with snare drums, that's like 90% of uh, of uh, of the drum sound, really. Um, because, I mean, the kicks, they sound like they do when you, you usually you trigger a lot anyway. And, and uh, the toms, I mean, how much do you hear of the toms? Uh, so I've been focusing a lot on like different kinds of snare drums and, and that depends so much on the style, it depends on the personality of the drummer the kind of the, the sound that fits with the music and that works with that drummer so it's very hard to give any specific uh, pointers on that um, but the Ludwig uh, Black Beauty is always a great choice. It's very expensive. There are other brass snare drums that are really good as well. Uh, but if, if, you, if you got the money, then one of those is, is always good to have. Um, Supraphonic, also Ludwig Snare. Oh, they're really great uh, aluminum, I believe it is. Um, so, yeah. But I, I would say like if I if I could only have two snare drums, I would probably pick those. Awesome. And what about cymbals? I've always been a Zildian guy. Um the A customs worked really well with recordings. Um they're not too uh, they're not too loud, they're not too intrusive, they're not too piercing. If you choke them, they they get uh, quiet right away instead of having a bunch of ringing. So they're really like really good bread and butter kind of symbols. Uh, but I also like, for example, with Hellhammer uses um, pasty rude, which are really thick. Uh, and the way he plays them, because it doesn't hit the 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 symbols very hard, so it it just works perfectly for him. I think with others, like if you if if someone is really like bashing the 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 symbols, it doesn't really work. So it depends a bit on drummer, but um, a a custom is usually uh kind of foolproof. Okay, gotcha. And um, yeah, since you mentioned uh, Hellhammer, I ended up um, I was at the Mayhem show in Seoul, South Korea, earlier this year. So I, <laughs> yeah, I um, no, I used to live there. That's why I just came back to the UK a few months ago, and um, that that kind of leads me nicely on something I wanted to talk about as well. Like um, when it comes to the live sound. Um, what's your approach for the live sound when it comes for um, when it comes to working with um, both Mayhem and Vertain? Like, what do you? What's the most important thing um, as a sound engineer that you need to keep in mind, and how do you approach it? It, it there are some kind of standard things like you need to get rid of get rid of mud, uh, but I also work very much with uh, taming the high mid range. I always want to like even if it's really loud. I want you to be able to be in the audience without headphones and without having your ears ringing when you get out of there. And uh, I've found that uh, the high mid range is just uh, killing your ears when it gets too loud. So um, that's really my go to. I always cut a lot of high mids. Um, but apart from that, I. I go very much in detail when I when I set up the the main system sound. I I do so much processing is 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 ridiculous really. Uh, same with the guitars because the guitars are, are such a big part of the sound. And if the guitars sound like crap, then everything will sound like crap. I mean, drums is is not 
it, it's not rocket science to mix it, but with guitars, it it has to be perfect. So I focus a lot on that. I do a lot of processing. A lot of people would probably say it's it's too much, but it it works. So, um, yeah, that that's really the key thing. Get to, get some control of the high mids, mid range in general, but high mids especially, and get the guitars to sit so you can play them loud without being annoying. So, uh, yeah, everything else is just like extras surrounding it. Okay. So what kind of guitar processing do you do then? A bunch of EQ. Okay, sure, sure. And what's your favorite guitar amps to use both live and studio? Mm, uh, the 5150 or 6505 always uh, works really well. It's, it's, it's easy to get a good sound with. Uh, so uh, that's something that I, I, we work with it a lot live and uh, it, it, ju it just always works uh, I really like the um, JCM 800 um, the old 2203 model uh, so I use that a lot uh, what else I, mean, I have a bunch of amplifiers but it's, it's those two that I use the most uh, sometimes a dual rectifier if I want something a little bit more kind of washy sound, uh, it's a little bit kind of distant. Um, there's also, I mean, it's uh, especially with the with the JCM eight hundred, which pedal you put in front of it will will have a huge impact. Uh, much less so with the like fifty one fifty is just like more high gain uh, in itself. Hmm. Um, I guess I could mention for clean guitars, I like to use uh, um, uh, Fender. Um, which one is it? Jesus, uh, yes, Fender amp, uh, dual reverb or something. Oh, yeah, the deluxe uh, thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, also the uh, JC120. Great for 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 clean guitars, um. So yeah, I I think that's what I use the most. But uh, for live situations, like nine times out of ten, we go for sixty five or five. Uh, for the the mysterious tour, we use JCM eight hundred because it's just more true to what was used on on that uh, recording. Um, I should really also mention cabinets because I, I I think cabinets have a much bigger impact on on the sound than uh, than uh, uh, than the amplifier so it, it's very important to use something that works with the sound you're going for uh, if you're generally if you if you play like tune down a lot and you you, you can you can use brighter cabs, but if you play like standard tuning, you have to have something that kind of dulls the, the high range a bit. So cabinets are super important. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that entirely because I'm, I recently got a, a Marshall Mode 4 cab. That's this one here, the MF400. Have you tried one of these? Uh, no. Okay. Epic sound. Really, really cool mid-range, really like just more just more like a punch in the face um, because this one here, the Black Star, that's got, um, I think it's got V30 speakers in there and it's got that kind of, um, it's definitely a lot brighter. Uh, you can tell like there's um, more of the mid range taken out in the EQ. And um, yeah, that's one thing I really, really noticed because I really love how, um, like there's some amps that I've put through the Black Star and the Black Star cab and they sound great. And then, when I put them through the Marshall, they sound completely different. And it, it's got that kind of yeah. like, um, you know, it's kind of got that kind of like, I, I don't know how to explain it, but you know that part of the low end in the bass where it's a bit loose and like woofy and it's not super, super tight. Um, but that happens as well. Um, but I don't know, like I'm using a, I'm using a JVM uh, a lot at the moment. I love this thing and I'm running it through. Mm -hmm. the yeah, it's a 410, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I have one right here next to me epic yeah one of my favorite amps and um 
I used yep. to use yeah, they're great. It's interesting because when I play with um six five oh fives, it's like it's it's like how you said they always sound r quite good mic'd, but for me in the room I just I really don't like how they sound when when I play through them anyway. Um it's just it's just curious. They have a very pronounced mid range. Uh I like to call it nose. Uh kind of a nasal sound. Um mm -hmm. so I think for like this kind of technical and chugging kind of stuff where, where you want to hear every every little detail, it's great. Uh, if that's not what you're going for, it's it's a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, I, know. I think yeah, I think that's what it is. Because um, when it comes to my guitar sound, I still want it to be precise, but I like that kind of rawness and a kind of um, I don't know, a, a more of a darkness the, that you get more from a Marshall and, or an Engel than instead of the PV, if you know what I mean. Yep. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it, it's the Marshalls, especially, they have a, kind of a high, high range, or just like a, a crisp mm. that you definitely don't get from the, from the PVs. Um, it, it's more of a loose sound, uh, also with the Mesas, very much with the Mesas. Um, so it's kind of, I, I, I did a lot of stuff with 5150 and, and the V30 cabs, and I was just going that direction because everyone else was doing that. So I, I kind of just jumped the bandwagon. Uh, but then eventually, like I, I just, um, I just flipped like 180 and, and, uh, I started using Marshalls. I, I really like to use the, you know, just the standard 1960 cabinets uh, with the, with, is it the T1275? I can't remember what they call, but you know, like 75 watt speakers, just the standard stuff. Uh, it's it, it's this old school kind of sound that uh, that I really like. So it, if, if you look at Cabinets nowadays, ninety percent of them have V30s, which I think is completely it, it's it's moronic. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's 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 but it's it's the it's the speaker that you hear on on everything, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I found that as well. I find that as well. I kind of like how this one has got that. I like that how this cab does not have V30s in it because it's just different. It's, it's more the case of like finding your own sound in a way, which which leads me on to a nice, um, an interesting topic, which is when um, when you're approached by bands and then they're saying they kind of want their band to sound in this way, like in a certain way. Um, how do you go about that as a producer? Because because where is that balance for you between what the band wants, whereas what the um, what, what the producer wants or more the kind of how do you how do you help a band achieve the sound in their head oh um yeah i mean this is it's a very important topic and and this is something that i try to focus on a lot because you do you want the band to have their own personality uh I like to take this example with like back in the days, if you put on carcass, you heard that it was carcass. If you put on bolt thrower, it, it was like unmistakable. Uh, you put on uh, Morbid Angel or these, it was like everything was just, you could hear which band it was. And it's, it's uh, production has gone so far away from that. It's just silly. Uh, the It's, uh, every. I mean, everything sounds, great everything sounds amazing everything is like everything is put in place but that's always that's also the problem uh so you, you 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 edit everything to death and and you use the same boring guitar sound and, and the same drum sound same drum samples whatever uh on everything so this like, is so much of the personality that is gone so that's that's the my first thing the first thing i go to and just try to find the personality of the band it's not super easy. A lot of times they don't really have any kind of background in in uh, in, in, a, in like a sound picture. 
uh, so there's nothing to go on. But I like to, if let's say, I mean, if it sounds like something, some old stuff, if it sounds a bit like, uh, uh, what example could I take? Emperor, whatever. It's like, if, if it sounds a bit like that, they would probably go a bit in that direction. Um, so yeah, I, I, I look, a lot in the in the rear view mirror and uh, I have my ideas of how certain t- styles of music should sound and that's kind of my my starting point um of course I I also I mean I only have my set of ears so it's it's very hard you know when you start tweaking guitars especially in like uh I start hearing like certain frequencies that are jumping out. So I like start cutting that. So it starts like molding into kind of my sound or something like that, which I never like. But it's it's just uh, something you, you can't get away from. But I, I really tr- always try to to give the band their personality. And I mean, if if a band comes to me and they really like Vatain and they want to go for something similar. <laughs> Who am I to say, like, we're going to do something completely different that would just be dumb? No, I get you. I get you. No, that makes sense. And I think that's, um, it's interesting that you mentioned about, like, looking into the past as well, because after talking to Nocturno Colto, um, he was saying, it's interesting because his intake on everything, you know, things were becoming too sterile. And... Um, and, it, and it's interesting that you said that as well, um, about like looking back into the past, making things a bit more analog and organic and making things have their own personality as well. I just, um, I, I know, just just very interesting parallel as well. And um, it's something that I've been thinking about a while as well. And going back to what you said, how everything just has to be like perfect, clean, perfect polish. You need to hear this, 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 um, going to this sound and this samples. And... Exactly, because it, it's, it's a lot of, uh, I fell into the trap as well. When uh, when I switched from working with tape and, and working with desks and then I just started doing things in the computer and uh, I I mean I was I was along for that whole development. If you go into it nowadays as a as a recording engineer, producer, whatever, you have all these tools. It's it's amazing. Like you have everything at at your fingertips. But uh, but that whole progress of uh, always trying to always being limited by the equipment that you had, and then uh, start starting to use the computer, and then you had the possibility to do this all all this manipulation, and I just started doing that like crazy, uh, and eventually I just had to pull the emergency brake because it was just. Yeah, you're just killing the music. Um, so it, it's a lot of like, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. And and it's so easy to, to fall into that. Once you start like editing drums, yeah, well, this one is tiny, a little bit out. So like you start moving that out, but then you have to move that. Okay, now this part is perfect. Now I have to do that. So like you, you just chop everything up. So like what was the point with having a drummer then anyway? So it, it's 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 super easy to 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 fall into that kind of uh, philosophy, and uh, yeah, it's it's something that you you have to try to find some kind of balance for. Yeah, for sure, for sure, because it's so easy to just copy and paste and change things and uh, kind of take some of the heart out of the music as well. Some of that kind of natural. Um, that natural inconsistency, like it, you can still make like a drum part or a guitar part tight as hell in like the raw take. But if you're just like moving everything too much, you just I don't know. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and I, mean, I mean, when I was starting out, yeah, you could you could like punch in and stuff. But uh, the the more you did it, the more you degraded the the sound. Like uh, you're just recording over and over on tape, and sometimes you might get a glitch or whatever. So uh, it's 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 way too easy nowadays, and also like working with A dots. If you wanted to like redo a part, and you have to uh, you have to rewind them and then wait for them to sync up, and then press play, and then it took another two seconds for them to sync up to play. 
uh, so like all that stuff is is just making it so that you didn't want to do too much of just a bunch of takes of everything, but uh, or a, a, a bunch of correction. Uh, but the way it is now, it's 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 too fast, it's too easy, so people just fall for it. Mm. Yeah, I get you. And um, going back to recording, like, what was your most challenging recording session for yourself? And also working with another band. Well, I, I'm I'm not going to say anything about like bands that were difficult to work with because I don't like to talk about it. But um, uh, musically, like one of the bands that I w- it was a challenge, but it was also it's also been very interesting. Every time I worked with them, uh, it's uh, Inferno mm-hmm. uh, because they have kind of the the skeleton of the music which is kind of like what they jump on first but then there's all these layers and uh, all these little details and you have to kind of try to get all of that to to play together so uh i I do like two albums for them i think two or three i think it's two um it's it's been very interesting and very challenging to work with them so uh, yeah, I th- it's, it, that's probably it. Hmm. The, the more layers, the more difficult, basically. Oh, I see, I see. And what about for yourself? Like when you were recording, like let's say the most challenging drum uh, recording you've had to do yourself. Uh, back when I was doing Funeral Mist, it was a lot of. Uh, it, it was a workout, like. I had to get through that whole fast part. If you look at drummers, like the, like the new school drummers, they're just sitting there like completely relaxed and just like fiddling with the drums. But uh, I was when I was playing, it was uh, it was really like just pushing the limits. I I never really liked it actually. I I I uh, I, I got a bit bored and like in. Uh, when was this like mid 90s like everything just started getting faster and faster and faster and then it got like ridiculously fast and i couldn't keep up with it so i just lost it i lost interest in that um so that was challenging in a physical way um other things like uh I'm, I, I can't i can't really remember what i've done really but um uh, like one of the last things that I did was the the Ofer Mode album that never came out. That one I just kind of pushed myself when it came to the playing and just trying to perfect that. Uh, there's uh, kind of a precursor to that uh, on an album with the band called Heresy, uh, where I'm not listed as the drummer because I thought the guy was a little bit weird so i didn't want to be associated with him but i played on the uh, uh, i think they released two albums and I played on both of them uh and on the second one i i really like the drumming of that uh that album is impossible to find so don't even bother going back to live experiences what was it like being a the live bassist for vatain back in the day um it was uh it it was a good experience because I actually I had never been outside of I had I had never played outside of Sweden, and uh, what few live shows I had done was with my first band, uh, the Death Metal band that I was in, and when when we played with Funeral Mist, we, yeah, we did we didn't do any live shows, so I hadn't been out much, and yeah, it was it was just like. Uh, doing some things that I had always wanted to do get out on the road, do some shows and like a bunch of different places do a bit of touring so yeah I think that's what that was the biggest reward for me when it came to that okay sweet and then of course that must have led to your um, well, your many years working with Vartain actually no no it's the other way around I, I started working with them so I, I recorded their 7-inch, uh, was the first thing I did with them. 
uh-huh. uh, then uh, we recorded uh, Rabbit Death's Curse, and mm-hmm. after that, I was out for them as bass player. How's it been working with the band for what two decades? More than that? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's something that I it's, it's a, it feels very natural. But when I think about how much time that we have spent together and uh that it's basically what what big part of my life it is it's basically my my entire adult life uh so far um then that's a pretty massive thing really yeah and um how's it been like watching the band change and develop and grow over the years uh great it it's what i always wanted for them it, it's uh they were very rough around the edges in the beginning and it's just been a bit development but it's also been something that uh f- for me okay i i do have a bit of a um uh, musical education background which they, i don't think any of them have it so uh i i have a bit of that from from the start but uh we we've been developing together a lot and uh it's always been great to work with them because uh, when it comes to how, what to do in the studio wh- where to go like uh sound wise we're they're very open to what i what i have to say or what i will suggest but we we tend to have very similar ideas also like when i start hearing the demos i start getting a picture in my head of uh, how it's going to sound and that's there's never been any argument about it so it's it's really very much been like a coexistence thing okay yeah great awesome man and um what's your favorite vartane album then uh, the the last one. Um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. I've forgotten the name of it. Agony and Ecstasy. Uh, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Cool. And why why this one? I guess it's okay. So f- first of all, I re- we recorded it here in in this place, which I really like. I don't know if you know the development of the studio, but this is uh, basically the. Well, you could say the third, like, professional studio, but it, it's really the fourth. Uh, but here, I just everything is just built exactly the way I want. Uh, I I didn't skimp on anything. I just like I just went like all in. Uh, the The studio is designed by this uh, famous Swedish designer, so it's like control room sounds amazing, and uh, so it, it's. Uh, it's a very nice place to work. If you compare with the old stuff, like recording in basements and and just sitting like in in the darkness uh, all day and all night, it's it kind of wears you out. So here it's uh, it's been very different. Also, I really like the approach that they had and that we had that uh, they were all playing together. So they were all in the hall uh, playing, and and we tracked that. We didn't use all of it, like the bass parts, guitar parts. Uh, we we did brush up some things, but that's basically how we did the drums. So the whole thing is very organic. We didn't use any click tracks, nothing like that. I, I, and they had rehearsed so much; they were super tight when they got here. And then we we just we just kind of refined it from there, so it that was a really good experience. And going back to when you're working with bands, what makes a band good to work with in the studio? And for all the people who have never had like the experience working in a studio, what do you uh, or even working in studios or uh, working with producers and recording in studios? What do you recommend for all these people? they have to be prepared i think that's always the biggest mistake that uh that uh, people make when before they go to the studio when they come to the studio they're not prepared enough 
And I'm not saying like you have to work out every little detail of every song, but you have to rehearse a lot. You have to you have to play like it's just running water. Um, it it it's so depressing to do 500 guitar takes just because like you can't nail this tiny little part. It's so unproductive. Uh, so that's that's definitely the 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 biggest part of it. For sure, because the biggest enemy in the studio is time. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess so. I guess it's also because, uh, and this is a thing that I never get, but uh, you know, you have this thing with the studio nerves. Uh, so I know like people come here and, and uh, they just play at maybe like 70% of, of their capacity just because they're nervous. So that's also a thing to try to not really think about it as as something that uh i mean it's not a sports event and just try to feel creative and 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 relaxed in the studio i think that's a very important thing as well yeah because it's like you said um not only do you need people to be prepared people need to actually feel the music and have these really really more more emotion in the takes i guess and then that can create a much better result because if it's just like because you can completely tell like when a guitarist is playing versus when they're playing and the same thing with a drummer and a bass player and stuff and i think stuff like that really really um it, it does affect the um the final performance and, and the final take but one thing i can say about that is also uh when you rehearse the object is not just to go through the songs it's to identify the problems and and correct them and pe people miss this so much like uh, there might be some part that uh, that you just can't nail and you might be able to do it in the studio like i said after like, like 50 takes maybe you nail it. It, 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 it don't do that like practice that like crazy practice that part for like a day or two and then and then it then you have it uh it's so breaking things down uh if it's drum parts especially like take the tempo down play that until it's like until you really nail it just take the tempo up and I, actually it's also for it's for all instruments really mm. uh so things like that super important also don't don't play just like really loud in the rehearsal place so you can't really like all mistakes are just kind of washed out focus on what you're doing it's really good to do pre-production demos uh also that bands send to me because then i can listen to it and i can identify okay the guitar player is a little bit like sloppy on this part so uh things like that it, it that's also like part of preparation really but uh, really focus on, on on what you're playing and how it sounds for sure and it it really comes to show like the best um I'm, it must be like the best type of bands to work with are the ones that are prepared know their shit they have the vision and they're able to play yeah yeah exactly and then yeah that's also the like, last thing you said if i mean it's there are some people that come into the studio that just nail their parts, and then then when that happens, you, then you can just focus on maybe like getting getting a different groove or something like that, rather than just getting someone to not play it wrong. So it is really great when it's like some someone who's like very skilled musician, obviously. Hmm. For sure. And um. When it comes to um, some other bands you've worked with, who have been your favorites? Um, well, I have to say Batain, because it's such an involved experience all the time. Um, other bands, yeah, Inferno, as I mentioned. Uh, Valkyria has been good to work with. I can't remember what I've done. Okay. It, it's 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. I've, I've, I've worked with so many bands. There are so many bands that were great to work with. I just can't remember right now. If I had the list in front of me, I would. I, would, I could pick a bunch. Okay. Sure. Adore you. Yeah, <laughs> that's all good. It's all good. And how did you get? Um, how did you get working with Mayhem? Um, we okay. So, uh, Vatain were doing a tour in uh, Australia. And uh, it, it was, I, I think it was co-headliner or or main or headliner, but I think it was co-headline. And uh, I was asked if I could do sound for Mayhem as well. And uh, yeah, I thought it sounded interesting. So uh, I went with that. And uh, they seemed happy. Uh, we came back home. I asked their... Uh, tour manager at the time like if they had anything more coming up and they had a European tour like a month later so I signed up for that as well and then it just went on from there I uh, after that with some exceptions I've done everything with Mayhem all live shows how was the process working on Demon their most recent album what we did do because for me Mayhem is a lot about the drums and the vocals. So that was my main focus, really. And uh, being a drummer, of course, it's it's even easier to be able to do that. And also, I know what Hellhammer is capable of. I know what kind of style of his drumming that I, that I like. So I was pushing a lot with... Uh, pushing a lot in that direction i was giving him references that that we both know um so it was it the drums was really a development uh the vocals as well um i think with attila when he when he doesn't get uh, enough direction he might be doing it in a little, little bit kind of just straight forward way but the same thing there. I'm, I know what he's capable of. I know what he's done in the past. So I would just be referencing uh, and giving him like a, a picture to have in, in his mind. And um, for the drums, the two guitar players were here, but the, the uh, for the vocals, it was only me and Attila. So that was also a very cool experience. Just have him here in the church hall, just belching it out. All right, it, it was amazing. Yeah. So cool. So n your studio now is in a church because that's one thing I wanted to um, to dive in is just dive in more on was like the story behind Necromorba Studio because I remember how you you mentioned um, this this is like technically the fourth variation. So what's the story? Uh, I, I I did as so many others. I just started out in. Uh... In, well, it wasn't in my parents' basement because there was no basement, but uh, I, I, I had my studio there. My dad was, or my parents were super supportive, but my dad helped me like build the 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 rooms and a little bit of like uh, improvised acoustic treatment, acoustic treatment and stuff like that. So that's where I started doing stuff and that was with the four track uh, porta uh, studio um then i got that 16 channel setup uh i did that at home for like a couple of months but then i was like okay this is just is too much like i need i need a proper place so uh, uh i managed to find a place uh, again through my dad and he helped me like build the the that studio it was uh it was an old bomb shelter so it was pretty limited in what you could do like there there were walls that you couldn't uh take down so we kind of had to build it to fit in with the the layout of of, of the of of the of the place um 
that I had the control room that was way too small and uh, way too warm. Uh, so eventually, I was there for probably like actually for how many years? Uh, I it's, it's not important, but it, it was for a bunch of years, and a lot of this early stuff, of course, is recorded there. Uh, eventually lost the contract. Uh, managed to find another place. Uh, it was a little bit more of an open space, so it it, it was possible to to uh, uh, make like a bigger control room and uh, have a bit more space in general. Um, so yeah, the place was pretty nice, but it was still like I, I, everything that was built there was just me basically improvising and trying to come up with solutions for for acoustic treatment and so and so on and just experimenting and uh, i the, the thing is I, I always had this uh, wish that eventually i would uh, because i was always renting so eventually i wanted to buy my own place i wanted to just build a studio the way i wanted uh, and yeah without compromise so that's exactly what i did here uh, we bought this place, which was just kind of a skeleton of a house, and uh, it it's it has such a potential. This house, it's uh, it it was messed up when we got it, but uh, and we we this is like a lifelong project and just like fixing things and uh, uh, it, it's not only like I'm sitting here in the control room. It's just like the 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 first. Thing that was finished for the studio. Uh, I have a booth here next to me, but and and that one is almost finished at this point. But the hall is kind of like how it how it was. Uh, I've started to do some stuff. I have I have plans. I have plans for the lounge. I have plans for the kitchen. It's all these things, but uh, it's it's uh, it's still fully functional. Everybody who's been here really love it. It's such a different atmosphere. It's in the countryside. I'm just so tired of being in the city and and uh, that stuff. It's it's just so calm out here. So this, yeah, this is kind of the. I guess this is the last step, really. Fuck yeah, you <laughs> you bought a church and turned it into a studio. That's epic. Do you have any final? Final thoughts um, to share to anyone who's looking to start bands and start recording with bands, or even advice for drummers and and how to improve. Um, uh, do you have any final thoughts or any final comments? Yeah, you you need to practice a lot. Uh, don't just rush through things. Break it down. Uh, learn it properly. Um, do things at the slow tempo, just gradually take it up. I see this people making this mistake over and over and over. Um, so that's like if if you're starting as a musician, that's it's super important. Uh, learn a bit of uh, music theory. Uh, many people think about it, or people who kind of don't want to do it think about it as uh that's it, that it's going to limit you in a way that's not the point the point is to basically learn a language i would say and and then be able to communicate with other musicians that is something that it's it's i mean when i have to sit here in the studio i say like play an a and then i have to point it out on the guitar like play here this fret it, it's it's very annoying. Learn a bit of music theory. Know your instrument, and yeah, practice, practice, practice. <laughs>